welcome to ICU Primary Prepcast. Hi, my name is Swapnil and it's my pleasure to introduce you to the new series called as Primary Snippets. Now, in this series, we are trying to answer the questions which have been asked in CICM exams and has got a pass rate of less than 50%. So this is an attempt to help you to tackle those difficult questions and get you through your primary exams. And in each episode, we'll discuss only one question, trying to bring these episodes more frequently to you throughout the month and then throughout the year. The question that we are going to discuss today is about the critical illness and its impact on pharmacokinetics. A few things to understand with the pharmacokinetics. It describes the movement of a drug through the body. It is divided into four major components, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination. Now, when it comes to absorption, Absorption is the rate and extent of medication that leaves the site of administration and moves into circulation. Usually when you talk about absorption, the key terms that we use, the first one is called as bioavailability, which is the fraction of administered drug reaching the systemic circulation. Now this can be quantified by area under the curve or peak concentration. And usually we measure the peak plasma concentration. Now, factors that influence the absorption or bioavailability can be classified into drug factors or the root-specific factors. The drug factors include particle size, solubility, lipophilicity, ionization, and dissociation rate constant. So obviously, if the particle size is smaller, the particle is more soluble, lipophilic, and easily ionizable, the bioavailability will be higher. Also, it depends on the root-specific factors, which include gastric pH, regional blood flow, surface area, and motility. And the gastric pH is obviously relevant to the drugs which are administered orally. But if, if you're going to administer the drug via subcut route, then the regional blood flow will be important. Now, how does the changes in critical illness impact the pharmacokinetics with regards to absorption? The first change if there is a decrease in GI or subcutaneous perfusion due to shock or vasopressor use, that will lead to decrease in time to peak concentration and also it will lead to decrease in area under the curve. If the drug is administered orally, critical illness tend to impact the GI motility and it usually tend to decrease GI motility and the settings include surgery, post-op ileus, trauma, burns, head injury, sepsis, and heavy opiate use. If there is a decreased GI motility, that will lead to decrease in time to peak concentration, and also it will decrease in area under the curve for the drug. Now, the use of enteral nutrition formula is quite common in critical care, and this will also lead to decrease in area under the curve. And certain drugs need to be administered empty stomach in order to be absorbed fully, for example, thyroxine. Now, with regards to distribution, the drugs can be classified into two different categories, hydrophilic drugs and lipophilic drugs. Hydrophilic drugs are the drugs which remain in plasma water volume, and hence their volume of distribution is usually equal to 0.65 liters per kilogram. And the examples include morphine, beta-lactams, aminoglycosides, fluconazole, and acyclovir. While lipophilic drugs are the one where the volume of distribution is quite large, is usually more than 0.6 liters per kilogram. And the examples include fentanyl, propofol, fluoroquinolones, linezolid, macrolides like azithromycin, metronidazole or flagyl, amphotericin B, Bactrim, tetracycline, and ticacycline. How does critical illness impact distribution? So for example, fluid resuscitation, will lead to increase volume of distribution and it will lead to decrease in peak concentration of hydrophilic drugs. While decrease in circulating albumin will lead to increase in volume of distribution and free plasma concentration of the drugs that are bound to albumin. For example, warfarin, phenytoin or midazolam. Also, in critical illness, there is an increase in alpha-1 acid glycoprotein or AAG levels which will lead to decrease in volume of distribution and free drug concentration for drugs that are bound to alpha-1 acid glycoprotein. And the classic example is lignocaine. In critical illness, there's also decrease in tissue perfusion due to shock state, 
which lead to decrease in free drug concentration in peripheral tissues. For example, there is an impaired delivery of tadosine to skeletal muscles and peripheral tissues. Hence, if you are going to tackle the necrotizing fasciitis, usually you need to choose the agents which are going to reach the muscles in sufficient concentration. Now, with regards to metabolism, the key sites in the body include GI tract, kidneys, liver, lung, and brain. The most important site out of all these is liver. When it comes to metabolism in liver, there are a few important terms that we need to understand. Hepatic clearance. Hepatic clearance is the volume of blood that is completely cleared of drug by liver per unit time. And it can be calculated by the formula. Hepatic clearance is equal to hepatic blood flow multiplied by hepatic extraction ratio. Now, hepatic extraction ratio is nothing but the fraction of drug that is removed from the blood after one pass through the liver. And based on the hepatic extraction ratio, we can classify drugs which have got a high hepatic extraction ratio, which is usually more than 0.7. That means the 70% of the drug is removed from the blood after one pass through the liver. And the examples include fentanyl and midazolam. While the drugs with having low hepatic extraction ratio, that is less than 0.3, the examples include phenytoin and warfarin. Now, the drugs which have got a high hepatic extraction ratio, like fentanyl and midaz, are less influenced by hepatic function derangement, but they are more influenced by changes in hepatic blood flow. On the contrary, drugs like phenytoin or warfarin, which has got a low HER, are less influenced by hepatic blood flow, and they are more influenced by changes in hepatic function. Now, liver metabolizes many drugs, and that happens in phase one and phase two. The phase one reactions usually include oxidation, reduction, and hydrolysis, which is usually caused by cytochrome P450 cysteine. While the phase two reactions include glucuronidation and sulfation or acetylation. Now, how does a critical illness impact the metabolism phase? Critical illness leads to decrease in activity of hepatic inducing enzyme in cases of burns, cholestasis, or hypothermia, which will ultimately lead to decreased hepatic clearance of drugs which has got a low hepatic extraction ratio, like phenytoin and warfarin. On the contrary, in the shock state, when there is acute reduction in the hepatic blood flow, this will lead to decreased hepatic clearance of the drugs that has got a high hepatic extraction ratio, such as fentanyl and midazolam. Last important aspect of pharmacokinetics is elimination. So glomerular filtration is the primary mechanism responsible for renal drug clearance for most of the drugs, while the tubular secretion which occurs in proximal convoluted tubule via active transport is responsible for only some drugs. And a classic example of this tubular secretion interactions include quinidine and digoxin, because the quinidine and digoxin, they both compete with each other for active transport proteins in PCT. And because they're competing for excretion with each other, quinidine administration with digoxin leads to increase in digoxin concentration in plasma and hence leads to digoxin toxicity. Now, we can use the same phenomena to our advantage by administering probenacid with penicillin because probenacid competes with penicillin leads to increase in penicillin plasma concentration and thus helps to achieve the higher therapeutic levels in a quicker time. Tubular reabsorption can also be important in certain cases. And a classic example of this is urethary alkalinization. So this leads to increased reabsorption of basic drugs because basic drugs remain in non-ionized state when the pH is alkaline. While if the urine pH is acidic, that helps to enhance the elimination of acidic drugs. And that's why we tend to do urinary alkalinization with soda bicarb in salicylic toxicity. Now, how does the critical illness impact the elimination? So, obviously, if the patient has got AKI, that will lead to decrease in renal clearance of renally eliminated drugs, such as vancomycin, carbapenems, morphine, penicillins, etc. On the contrary, in critical illness state, we do see another phenomenon called as augmented renal clearance due to 
high GFR values, and that will lead to increase in renal clearance of renally excreted drugs. And that's why sometimes we do see that patient, despite being on vancomycin 1.5 or 2 gram BD doses, they do not achieve their th target or therapeutic levels. So when you have increased augmented renal clearance in critically ill patients, they need to receive higher doses of those medications. Now, the renal replacement therapy patient can be on CVVHDF, and that has got a variable effect on many drugs, usually drugs with large molecular weight, increased protein binding, and with a large volume of distribution are less likely to be removed by RRT. So that's the answer for this question for today. Uh, I'll be back in week's time with another question and answer. Till then, goodbye and have a nice time.